the uh, Steve and I were going to uh, try and uh, tape a little uh, family history and a JBF history all at the same time and so I suppose uh, uh, the the history of the Featon family is is what I have more or less specialized in doing a little research is uh, um, they left Germany and came to Wisconsin in the early 1840s and uh, John Featon has a chest that the original John Featon uh, when he came to America brought with him. The family when they came to America there was a father and mother and four sons and the uh, I don't have my sheets of, of uh, uh, historic data but it's on those. The four sons were uh, uh, two of them I believe were married and brought their wives along and uh, then uh, one of them, one or two of them was single. They settled at a little town in uh, northwest of Milwaukee at Hartford. And when we visited Hartford in 1977, uh, the... Uh, I think it was 73. 70, it? 73, 1973. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, a number of the Featon family uh, with the family name lived in the area and uh, one of the boys, uh, Wilmer Featon, still lives on part of the original farm that they bought uh, north of Hartford. Uh, they had a dairy farm and then uh, the, the original family helped build a little Lutheran church and there's a Lutheran there was a Lutheran school and a cemetery all there together, uh, not very far from the farm buildings. They sold the majority of the farm, and so Wilmer Featon just has maybe 10 acres or so in, in one corner of the place. Uh, I have to be, that wasn't Wilmer. Wilmer's one with seven kids, and... Uh, and uh, uh, the other one's name just slips by me right at this time. But anyway, uh, there was uh, uh, one peculiarity that we ran in, that I ran into when uh, uh, doing family history is uh, uh, of the four sons that uh, when they came to America, one of them, the boys died fairly early and he left a wife and two children. Later on, his younger brother married his widow and they had two children. So you had a case of, of, of uh, family. The same thing, um, the first child born in America was my grandfather, Gerhard Featon, who was born at Hartford in 1851. He was the first one, the first family member to be born in this country. Uh, Gerhard Featon had two children, uh, Clara uh, Bramer, Clara Featon Bramer, and uh, Benjamin Henry Featon, my father. And uh, they moved from Hartford uh, over into the Ripon area, which is not a great distance away, but uh, Ripon and Oshkosh area and that's where dad was born in 1879, December 10th, 1879. And uh, we had a, always had a picture at home of he and his sister in a brick house uh, near Ripon uh, with their bicycles as young teenagers. Uh, the family then moved from that area to New Richmond in St. Croix County and there was apparently a great influx to the New Richmond area in the early 1900s uh, in, in that general area and uh, they moved up there and uh, so did the uh, Krischke family. Uh, mother was a Krischke and her father came from Germany in uh, and uh, married her mother and and uh, uh, 
see. Anna Krischke was born in 1866, and so and and uh, Hattie Krischke Feeton, uh, my mother, was born February 17th, 1886. And Harold always remembered that uh, when Hattie was born, her mother was 20 years old, and so that. She was born in 1866, 1886, and then Harold was born in 1896, 10 years difference between Hattie and Harold, and Artis, the youngest of Anna Krischke's daughters, was born in 1906. And so this was his method of remembering the birth dates of the family that, that Grandma Krischke was actually, had children 20 years apart with the two two daughters who were 20 years apart. Um, the Krischkes moved out onto the Star Prairie Road and they bought a bare land and Ernest Krischke, my grandfather, built a very fine home and set of farm buildings on an acreage there. And uh, uh, Later, he had three sons, George, Alvin, and Harold, and the three boys farmed quasi adjoining places as uh, they didn't all line up, but they, the, the farms were very close together, and so they did quite a little farming together. Uh, Hattie Krischke Feeton, my mother, was the oldest of the children and so she was the first to leave home and when she married uh, uh, Ben Feeton, uh, he had bought acreage on a mile away from where Hattie's folks did. It was a little over a mile, but it was a section line away on the uh, uh, New Richmond to Huntington and Star Prairie Road where versus the other was the Star Prairie Road. Uh, Dad built a complete set of buildings on the place where all of the us children were born at home and uh, uh, on, on the Wall Street place. Uh, the school was adjacent to our property and so at one time uh, there was uh, Anne, George, John, Bob, and Jim all in five of us in the <laughs> grades of this Wall Street school. And that was a fairly common thing to have happen that a large number of children from the same family would be going to a eighth grade school. Uh, George contacted diabetes in his uh, childhood and uh, so uh, there was considerable uh, concern about his condition at that time. Insulin wasn't uh, too much of a thing. And so uh, mother spent a great deal of her time going to try and find a doctor who would, could help George. And uh, uh, so uh, they uh, apparently got into trouble financially uh, on the farm. And uh, uh, the oldest of the family was Orville, and he was five years old when he drowned one spring and, and on just about uh, uh, north of the farmhouse. It, uh, he had a sled and he went down the hill onto the pond, and of course the ice was too soft to hold him, and he, he went in, and of course when mother and dad dis discovered he was missing, why they, they went there and found his sled, and, and and then, so that was uh, in uh, about 1915. And uh, Anne, of course, was uh, the only other child at the time. And then it was, uh, George was born in 1916, John in 17, Bob in 19, Jim in 21, Mary Jane in 23, and then it was a stillborn child in 25, and Dave in 27. So all of us were born there at the, at the farmhouse. And uh, I remember when uh, 
uh, dad was uh, selling the place and uh, and uh, uh, I think the sum was about twelve thousand dollars for the whole layout and and uh, the fella uh, that said it'll be a cash deal Ben and so it was a cash sale but they needed the money to pay off their obligations they had a little left over and uh, they bought a place at Star Prairie a farm and this was in 1928 and they bought it from mother's cousin and her husband uh, Hilbert and, uh, and, and Winsteads and uh, we lived on that place from 1928 to 1931 and uh, times were tough and I remember as a, a nine-year-old boy uh, that uh, Hilbert came over and told him that uh, they were going to have to move, that uh, he was going to take the place back because they'd been unable to make the payments. And uh, something that was quite unheard of, he, he told the folks that he would refund them all the principal that they had paid on the place, but he would keep the interest. And that's unheard of because he could have just foreclosed and, and uh, so forth. Uh, this was in 1931, and, and uh, uh, one of the things I remembered as a, as a child on that place is, uh, I would suppose it was about uh, uh, 1929 because George was with us at that time, and and uh, George and Bob and Mary Jane and I all came down with scarlet fever, and we were quarantined. And of course, we taped the door shut, and we lived in half of the house with Mother looking after us, and uh, the other half of the house was uh, Anne and and uh, John and Mary Jane and and David, who was very young. You see. And so they lived in the other part of the house and, and uh, trying to take care of four young children with scarlet fever, is, that was the winter mother's hair turned gray. And so that was just one of the things. And, and I, I know that uh, 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 we didn't have indoor plumbing, you know, and so we had to use the honey pot. And, uh, and of course, when she'd go out, why she'd come back and one of the kids would be missing and, and We'd tell her they, her they went outside, you know, and she'd just be hunt frantically for them, and they were in the house all the time. But th that was the chores that a mother had to do. And, of course, at that time, there was s s seven children there to be looking after. Uh, at that time, we moved into Star Prairie, and uh, to the best of my ability to remember, uh, uh, Uncle George Krischke, uh, loaned the folks some money to buy a house and they built a little service station on the corner at the bottom of the Star Prairie Hill. And uh, Dad had a sign up, I remember, that uh, said that he sold insurance and he tried selling feeds and various things and, and uh, running the service station and, and uh, times were just tough and, and so us boys all worked and, and we started with newspaper routes and John had them first and then passed them on to Bob and then passed them on to me. And uh, I remember uh, I uh, also uh, uh, had a lawnmower and bought a lawnmower and, and mowed the Lao trout ponds and, and other jobs and had all kinds of jobs because people knew that if they wanted to, somebody to work, why well, just call Featons and one of the boys would do it. I also, uh, when I'd go around and collect for the newspaper, started selling magazines and would take magazine subscriptions uh, for in the magazines too and, and send them in. And so uh, I uh, started early in life with an entrepreneurial uh, involvement and, and like, and uh, it, it followed me all the rest of my life. Uh, in the fall of 1936, uh, the, the service station was improving a little bit and uh, of course John and Bob were old enough to pump gas and sell it and so that gave Dad some relief. But uh, that summer uh, Bob worked out at Uncle Alvin's and uh, John drove truck for the feed mill and I 
mowed lawns and cleaned yards and so forth and, and with the newspaper out and and uh, of course I had a uh, motor out on Sunday and we went I went around the the, the Cedar Lake and and uh, there was three lakes and, and Pine Lake and I don't remember the name of the other one but uh, to the tourists that would come out there from the cities and had cabins and I'd uh, deliver the newspapers and sell them out there uh, 10 cents a piece or three per quarter if I had the uh, the Twin City newspapers and I had three different papers uh, uh, the uh, St. Paul Dispatch and, and uh, Pioneer Press and and uh, the Tribune I guess it was and, and so anyway uh, that uh, that's how we boys uh, spent the summer and that fall uh, dad had a chance to lease the house and the service station with an option to buy to a fella and uh, he paid uh, I believe it was $600 a year cash rent and uh, he uh, so the, the folks had enough money to pay their bills and we bought a newer car which was a, a 1931 Willys Knight and uh, a tr four wheel trailer and we loaded as much as we could into the trailer and, and, and uh, uh, then we, they put the other furniture in storage and uh, we started out and I remember we stayed overnight at grandma's the night before we left and Ardis was there and grandma and, and Harold and all of them bid us goodbye and we headed toward the Twin Cities and, and through southern Minnesota and uh, the uh, somehow I remember that uh, the amount of money that the folks had left after they paid $125 for the car $125 for the the homemade house trailer uh, very crude no running water or anything you know but uh, and uh, they had $112 left which we, we were heading west to seek our fortune and they really didn't have a place in mind uh, the first day or two out why uh, they talked about these folks they knew in California former neighbors and from that part of the country and uh, those that they knew in Oregon uh, the, the, the some of the uh, Utgards were in Portland and uh, then there was uh, others that had gone to Washington State and so they they, they tried to figure out which they would head for, California, Oregon, Wash or Washington. And of course, this was the last of September, and so it, it, was, it was the fall of the year. Uh, we drove and, and spent the, uh, the first night out was at Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, and then the, the, the uh, next night we, it was Denison, Iowa. And... Uh, Dennis and Iowa, why we hit Highway 30, which was a transcontinental highway, and, and by that time they'd kind of formulated the idea that they would take Highway 30 and go to Portland and then to Salem, where mother had an uncle by marriage and, and, uh, and his family in Salem, and, and that was uh, uh, the Rexes, and uh, uh, I believe his name was Raymond, and then there was uh, he had two sons. Howard and, and Viva, and uh, uh, Raymond, I believe, was also uh, with a different middle name than his father. No, the father was Arthur, and the son was were, were Raymond and Howard. Anyway, uh, we uh, started there, and of course, uh, driving a, a, a 1931 car and pulling a big trailer, which was built like a box, uh, the speed was very limited and uh, we took a long time getting through Iowa and Nebraska and uh, then into Wyoming and I remember the first hill we saw our mountain in Wyoming and it was a conical one and, and I think we spent a half a day approaching it you know it, it just you, you didn't get many miles then when we got into central Wyoming uh, the, it was a windy day and we just 
you couldn't get the car up to 25 miles an hour because it was just so much and we were bucking the headwind. So we decided to, uh, uh, dad and mother decided that we would stop and rent a motel and we could all get baths and, and, and uh, clean up and have a meal. And so we did that and that was the only time we had a motel on the, on the trip. And uh, I remember it was about one o'clock in the morning that dad woke us up and he said, boys, he said, better get up. The, uh, uh, I think the winds died down. And at that time, between a couple of the towns in Wyoming, where I was uh, just, uh, and maybe still is, is just a little over a hundred miles between the two towns. So that was uh, the distance and the wind had died down at one o'clock in the morning. And so we, we made good time and, and uh, got through Wyoming. Uh, incidentally, the car, there was six of us in the car. It was uh, uh, dad and mother and John and myself and uh, Mary Jane and David. And uh, of course that was uh, a load in itself. Uh, we got through Wyoming, got over the Continental Divide and, and uh, as we started uh, into Idaho, I, uh, they, we, th there was discussion about, well, that, lo that wasn't too bad looking country. And so uh, we stopped at Burley, Idaho and, uh, and hired on as uh, picking potatoes. Now you walk down the field with the sack between your legs and put the potatoes into the sack and, and drug it along and when it got full, why then you'd get a new sack. And, and of course it was just devastatingly back-breaking work. And we weren't used to it and so <laughs> the second day we, the decision had been made that we'd go on to Oregon and see if we could find something there. And uh, we drove on and, and uh, we, we had a little accident at, uh, at, out of Baker when some fella cut in too close and ran his trailer up over the, the fender of our car. And that took us a little time. And, and then when coming down the Columbia River Highway, that was quite a uh, tour in itself. And uh, when we were coming up to Crown Point, that was the only time that we, the pull up to Crown Point was quite quite a grade and with a big trailer and everything. And so the car was boiling when we got to the top of the hill, but we made it fine and uh, got down to Salem. Well, by then it was the 10th of October and uh, jobs in the uh, fall harvests were virtually uh, 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 the, the, the prunes and peach, apples and all of those type of crops had all been picked and so we couldn't find any work and we stayed in Salem about a week and of course uh, uh, I'm sure uh, we, we pulled the trailer into the Arthur Rex's yard and, and, and lived out of it but uh, that, that with a family of six is, is quite an imposition on to distant relatives so the folks decided they would uh, go back to Portland and on 82nd Avenue there were a lot of wood yards and 82nd Avenue was the main highway for East Portland to go and it joined with 99 at, at Oregon City and uh, that was the main highway. Uh, they stopped at a wood yard in, uh, in, uh, on 82nd Avenue and uh, they, Dad decided to take a job cutting cordwood. And so the place was uh, on Larch Mountain uh, and uh, with the Corbett address. And so there was a little, uh, a little house there that they, uh, we moved into. And uh, uh, we had bought and some, purchased some uh, a, a crosscut saw and sledges and, and a, a hammer and, and sledgehammer and, and the axis. And so we could go to work. Well, uh, it came Monday morning and so we were going to go out and I know that John and Dad had talked to the, one of the neighbors there about how to fall a tree and how to make an undercut and so forth and and so uh, uh, I was uh, uh, 15 and I, I said to Dad, well you want me to go, go along and help you and, 
he said, well, you can if you want. And so I became a high school dropout and went along with him to the woods. Uh, it was pretty foreign to us to cut these lovely big trees and fall them and, and uh, some of them why uh, the uh, eight foot saw would just barely get through because they were so big and they, to, today they'd be <laughs> the number one timber. But uh, we were to go along the highway and thin some of the ripe timber, fall some of the ripe trees that were in the highway, they left 200 feet before from the highway before they logged it off you clear cut it so we were we were cutting some gorgeous timbers uh, gorgeous lumber and some of it was hemlock and some of it was fir the first week the three of us cut enough wood to earn eleven dollars and uh, we knew we had to do better than that because eleven dollars wouldn't buy that much groceries you know and so uh, we uh, worked harder and with a little more efficiency and we got up to where we could make $18 for the three of us. So that was a dollar a day per, per dad, a dollar a day for John, a dollar a day for myself. And uh, John and dad would do the falling and bucking and I'd do the splitting and, and stacking. And so uh, we worked through the rest of October and all a month of November, and uh, we just really weren't able to improve much. Uh, we, we got a, a, a dollar a cord for the fur, and and uh, and I think a similar amount for the hemlock, and we could get eighteen or nineteen dollars, but that's as far as we could go with, with the earnings. So, uh, the we 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 just didn't know how we were going to make it, and of course, uh, mother got sick, and and. Uh, was sick of bed there for a while and so Mary Jane dropped out of school to take care of her and do the housework and so she became a high school dropout too and so uh, things were pretty tough and I can remember we, we took mother into a, a doctor at Gresham you know and one night you know he came back for an office for to his office and we were there and uh, dad says well uh, how much do we owe you you know and so he, he said three dollars would be fine you know and so uh, I, I think he had evaluated that if he would said five dollars why we'd have had to say can we make payments and so but we uh, we uh, went to the 21st of December and on the 21st of December it was a Monday morning and it was raining and we'd collected our pay for the previous week on Saturday they'd been out to pay us and uh, Dad says, you know, he said, I'm afraid this rain is liable to turn to snow and I'm afraid we're going to get, we get snowed in up here. Uh, I think we should take that job that they, we had a chance at over out of Gam Hill. And so uh, we went down and uh, we loaded our stuff up on, on Monday morning and, and uh, as we went through Corbett while we picked up Dave at school, to, to take him along with us, and and we uh, came over to Forest Grove and Yam uh, to, to take the job out of Yam Hill, which was up on Mount Richmond. Uh, this was uh, four days before Christmas, and and uh, uh, we stopped at Bush's service station, which was on Main Street, where today is Hardy's Auto Repair, and uh, there was a grocery store across the street, and the mother. Uh, bought the groceries that uh, she could and uh, uh, just very luckily the people that were gonna had told us we could get, give it gotten us a job at, at, at up on Mount Richmond were in town that afternoon and uh, they saw our vehicle and so they they stopped and and we visited with it a little bit and so uh, that was the uh, Kane family and they had uh, five boys and and uh, dad and mother and uh, so they said well gee whiz I didn't remember that trailer being that big you know they hadn't seen it out of the road and they said is your car running good because it's a pretty steep hill going up the, the Mount Richmond road to the top and so uh, John said well it really wasn't that we had a cracked spark plug and they said well maybe you ought to get a get a new one well we went around the corner behind the 
the uh, the uh, trailer in, and uh, everybody dug into the pocket to see how much money they had. And we had twenty nine cents in in the family, and uh, a spark plug was thirty five, and so we couldn't buy it. And Dad didn't want to ask for anything, you know, and and so uh, we put all the men and boys in our car and the women and in in their car and so when we got up that going up the Mount Richmond Hill way when we lost the power why the, we were we stopped and all of us got out and, and we just pushed in addition to that and we made it up the hill and so uh, what we had was a one-room shack and it was a sawmill shack and so with a family of six why we were in this one-room shack and we built a double deck bed so the mother and dad and Dave and Mary Jane could sleep in the house and John and I slept out in the trailer and uh, uh, we uh, just got water out of the creek that flowed right by the cabin and uh, the cabin had uh, a couple of windows in it and you know just a slab wood door and, and uh, a slab wood floor and, and uh, the unfinished lumber totally threw out and some shelves and stuff and we had a cook stove in one corner and then at the opposite corner was, was a heating stove and so that's the way we kept warm. And uh, John and I, the, 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 we had no heat in the trailer and so it got a little damp and cold out there sometimes but that was, we didn't see any problem with that and, and uh, actually uh, as we uh, got more experience at cutting wood and, and we over at Yam Hill while we got a uh, dollar and a cord for fir and a dollar and a quarter for oak because there was a fair amount of oak here, there and so uh, we we worked at it and, and uh, were able to make uh, oh maybe twenty dollars a week for the three of us and uh, the Kane family were our neighbors and they had the same kind of a shack as, as we did uh, theirs was perhaps just a little bit better uh, shaped in ours but uh, they they worked uh, hard and actually uh, their youngest four boys were in school and so it was just dad and one boy and they could just about cut as much wood as the three of us could. They uh, We never could keep up with them. They just were better woodsmen than we were I guess or harder workers. But anyway uh, uh, we survived the winter and uh, Uncle Harold had left the farm and he had uh, bought the home place from his mother and sisters after World War I in 1919 and they wanted to give him something because he'd been in the army and he was a returned veteran and so they said they would sell him the place and so they sold him the place for $11,000 in 1919. Well, in 1937, he just looked to him like he, he couldn't make any money and he wasn't making it. And so he, he left and said, if you think you owe me something when you sell a place, why I'll be out west and, and uh, with uh, Ben and Hattie and, and you can get, reach him there. So uh, uh, at that time, George bought the place for Edward and when Edward married he lived on that place and Richard on the home place. So that was uh, uh, took us through the the winter of 36 and 37 and in the spring of the year why uh, the sap starts climbing in the trees and so it's not as easy to cut them as, as it is in the in the winter and so we uh, moved to uh, Independence and uh, there were hop yards there. And so uh, uh, we got a job uh, hoeing hops. And uh, uh, the, when, when they were applying for it, why uh, uh, he said he'd take Dad and, and uh, John. And he said, uh, you're a little young, aren't you? And uh, I told him how old I was, but I'd, I'd, I would be 16 that summer, you see. And so he said, well, I'll, I'll give you a try. But he said, don't let me catch you at the tail end of the pack or you'll be down the road, you know, and so uh, we hoed hops and of course that likewise was, uh, they had a, a field boss and about 25 or 30 
hoers and, and you'd each take a row and, and hoe that. Well, of course, being a little green, why uh, I didn't always uh, lead the pack. And so when they had their first layoff, why I was on it. And so that meant that I had to find another job. And so I walked down the road and got one about three quarters of a mile down. And so not only did I have to get a new job, but I, I, I uh, had to walk an extra three quarters of a mile to get to work. And so uh, I decided I wouldn't let that happen again. And so I, I just would give it all, everything I had early in the morning and, and, uh, and uh, maybe skimp on the quality of work I was doing a little bit and get out in front. And then from then on, all you have to do is the same amount of work as everybody else and you're in the front all the time. It was a lesson I learned when I was 15 that I, I believed in that philosophy that get get your head started early and, and then you're ahead all the way. Well, we hoed hops and uh, we lived in a, they had a row of shacks that uh, all, all built up with one roof and just a single board partition between them and you had straw uh, straw beds and dirt floor and then a, a built up a little stove where you could uh, do your cooking and uh, that was pretty <laughs> pretty raunchy living but uh, and then we uh, had our trailer that we had close by and and uh, but it, it certainly wasn't very much privacy because with that single board between you and the neighbors why uh, you just had to be quiet or else they'd hear everything you were talking about but uh, when the uh, hops got uh, started and, and, and you got them vined and so forth why then there was kind of a period where you had to go out and find some other work and so uh, the whole family of us uh, went out and uh, and picked cherries in the Eola Hills just west of Salem and not too far from Independence and so uh, that meant uh, uh, Dad and, and John and by that time Bob was with us and uh, he, he came to us when we were in Independence and, and doing the hoeing of hops and so uh, but when it came to picking cherries why uh, Bob had started out from Wisconsin and, and uh, when he got to selling selling floor mats you know for behind bars and restaurants you know for the rubberized mats and, and uh, he couldn't get enough sales so he decided just to ride the rails and so he rode the rails in, into Oregon and, and down to Independence and, and found us and uh, uh, he was two years older, so he was just 17. He just graduated from high school the year before. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, we were, Dad and John and Bob and I and Mary Jane would all go out and pick cherries. And so we, uh, we could make enough to live on, but uh, we just never seemed to be able to save any money. And so uh, uh, it just, uh, was one of those things it takes money to feed a family of that size so uh, when the cherries were done well then we went uh, uh, we went to California uh, John and Bob and I and uh, his two twin brothers that were we became acquainted with to see if we couldn't uh, find work in California well we got down to Northern California and down into the Sacramento below Sacramento and we went out in the fields and there were there were people in in the orchards camping you know and working and uh, uh there was just no there was just two people were more for every job there before we got there and so we uh, we gave up on it and and headed back for oregon but that was uh, the first trip to california and we took the family car and and shared the expenses five ways and, and and came back to Oregon and then uh, uh, by, by uh, uh, toward early fall why the hops get ripe and so they need picking and so we picked hops uh, as, a, as a family and uh, and uh, then uh, uh, in the, it was getting in the fall of the year and so uh, we didn't have anything better and so we moved back to Yamhill to uh, 
and moving one of those palatial shacks that were down on the creek on the on the Jones place and and went back to cutting cordwood. Well, we stayed in, in one of those shacks, but actually what we did is we went down and worked on the Gaston Lake and picked onions. And uh, then uh, the, the, they were Japanese truck gardeners on the Wapato Lake. And uh, they, they would have uh, a few acres. Uh, I don't remember whether it was 20 acres that they could get in a patch. And uh, of course they'd build a row of houses along the lake when they drained it along the lake shore and uh, and the Japanese families were living there and and uh, so uh, we went to work for this Japanese family and and uh, I can remember the <coughs> mother I think there were eight children in the family and they were they were strong they'd take a row each and string them out and and the youngest one would be on the mother's back and the next the youngest would just be playing in one of the rows but they learned to work early and and uh, of course uh, they pick the onions and sack them all day and then of course after everybody else quit why uh, we'd stay on because there was four of us and and we'd load the trucks and they'd, they'd uh, haul the, the onions out that night you see after dark and that's we'd work 10 hours picking onions and then we'd work a couple hours and, and, and so it was pretty good and we, we made 30 cents an hour apiece. Well, when the onions uh, uh, finished, why uh, then Dad and I, uh, uh, well, John and Bob, started with the Jones boys, and they had a little sawmill on the place, and uh, they would uh, fall and buck for a day or two, and then uh, they would yard them in with a team of horses and, and for a day or two, and then they would run the sawmill for a couple of days and make railroad ties. and. Uh, then they'd have to haul out and they, the, the, the Jones boys had bought a truck and, and were hauling out. So uh, John and Bob uh, were working there in the woods with the, with the Jones boys on the saw, little sawmill operation and Dad and I got on a, 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 at the, uh, uh, what is now Montanor Vineyards, but it was, at that time it was the Forbes place. And uh, it was 400 acres and they had, we started in the fall and we picked pears first. And uh, then we went into, uh, uh, well, we picked pears and, and then when school started, why Mary Jane picked pears with us, then she, was, she started back to school with she and Dave at Yam Hill. And uh, Dad and I worked in the, after the pears in shaking prunes and then we shook uh, filberts and then shook walnuts. So we each, each man would have a 20 foot pole and a hook on it. And then you just walk around the tree with whichever with, with his uh, prunes, filberts, or walnuts. And so we'd put in 10 hours a day just shaking and looking up, and that, that was work. But uh, we pretty much covered that 400 acres of the Forbes place that fall. And then uh, after. Uh, after we finished all the harvest, why then they put us in the uh, uh, prune dryer and uh, there was a big bin of prunes and uh, we estimated about a hundred ton of dried prunes. And so they gave us a, a bunch of sacks and a scoop shovel and uh, Dad and I worked together and one would hold the bag and the other one would, would scoop the uh, scoop shovel full of prunes and then put them into the sack. And so this was... Uh, this was uh, how, how the system worked, and we just worked 10 hours a day and just, just sacking prunes all day long, and that, that was rather tedious <laughs> work. Well, anyway, uh, by this time, I ha had come to the realization that it's kind of a tough old road to hold this common labor thing, and I thought the, the first thing I needed to do was get back to high school, and so... Uh, uh, Mrs. Staley, which was uh, up on Mount Richmond, had had uh, one of the Jones boys had done her farm chores. She had five head of milk cows, and then they had a bull and some young stock and some pigs and horses and everything and, and chickens. And so uh, I went over to talk to her 
to see if she was interested that she had had a boy there at one time I had heard and, and uh, so uh, it was first of December uh, and uh, she came over and uh, Lester Jones came over and said Mrs. Staley wanted to have see Jim and have him do the milk and so uh, mother said well he'd never milked I think she must have met Bob and he said no she wasn't Jim and, and so he could go to school and so uh, we hiked three quarters of a mile over the hill from the, where our place was to the Staley place and Lester Jones and I and then we did the milking and uh, uh, I had uh, stretched my uh, qualifications a little bit that I had I, I had said I, I had not milked steady but I'd milked a little bit you know and, and uh, we went go out to the, the relatives and it was more just squirting enough out to get the cap fed. But anyway, uh, uh, by the time Lester had the other four cows milked, I was half done with mine. And the next morning I was on my own. So uh, I had to get up pretty early in the morning to start the milking and, and I didn't finish till after seven at night, you know, because uh, it was uh, I was inexperienced. And I had the five cows to milk, and then I had to, to water the livestock and, and feed the, the young stock and the pigs and the horses and everything. So it, it was a, it, a, quite a job. And uh, for that, I got uh, my room and board and five dollars a month. And uh, the school bus could not get up the hill because there wasn't enough gravel on the road and, and it hadn't been drained well. And so I had to carry the milk can, the cream can, down to the Ford place, which was about three quarters of a mile. And uh, Mrs. Staley's daughter was about 12 years old and she and I would walk down to the bus and she'd carry my books and lunch and, and I'd carry the, the, the cream can and that's, that's how we started. Well, came in uh, uh, about late February of, uh, uh, I, I started then to Game Hill to high school on the 1st of December in my junior year and uh, the school administration was very helpful and they said well they suggested I take English 3 and 4 in one year that way I would uh, would not have virtually any catching up to do in that part and, and uh, so uh, came a, a lot of part of February and uh, it got too wet to log and so Lester Jones came back from where he was logging and uh, that meant that I was surplus and so I went to the principal of the school and told him that I uh, needed a place to to stay and work so I could continue school and so uh, he called uh, Mrs. Mallory who lived just east of Yam Hill and uh, she had uh, a string of eight cows to milk and uh, and uh, uh, I went out to visit her and she was uh, disappointed because a, f a young fellow across the street was the same age as I was but he was a star athlete and uh, she just you know when, when you're milking cows and that's your livelihood why the regularity is is important and so he would uh, miss sometimes and her son would have to come over and do it or something like that and so she was kind of disheartened with him and so she said if I would promise not to go out for athletics baseball or basketball why she'd give me the job and I said well it looks to me like it's either no school or school under restrictions you know and she agreed that that was right and and so I said well I guess I better take the job and and, and that's what I wanted to do is finish school so I moved into Yamhill and uh, then I walked a mile into the school and and, uh, and uh, carried my lunch and, and uh, so uh, uh, I spent uh, uh, the, the, that spring uh, she her youngest son was young, the youngest son was in Linfield College and so he came home for the summer and so I took that opportunity to uh, uh, go to Forest Grove. The folks moved to Forest Grove and found a place there on Willamine Avenue and uh, so uh, uh, 
Dan and John and Bob and I uh, were a hay baling crew for Al Peters, and he was uh, a native of the Verbord area, you see, and Roy, and so we baled hay all summer for all those farmers out there, and uh, uh, it was a, it was a steady work, and and, and with the other two people were uh, Owen Scott and Alfred McVeigh, which were just out here from Missouri, and so. Uh, we were four and they were two and that that was uh, the six-man crew that they needed for hay baler and so we spent the uh, pretty much uh, uh, June July and and uh, probably into August uh, baling hay and uh, and so we all worked together well then uh, I went back to Yamhill for my senior year and uh, uh, in high school and uh, uh, had a very pleasant year. The Mallorys were just like family to me, and she had nine children. There was always some of them coming home, and and uh, she had a big house and a big table, and fed them well and fed me well, and and so I had a very pleasant uh, year and a half with uh, the Mallory family, and uh, so uh, uh, I I was not enamored with uh, the milk and cows, and so. Uh, after I graduated from high school, I uh, uh, I wanted to come to Forest Grove, and and uh, uh, Grant Scott and I were out looking for jobs, and we in the strawberry processors we didn't want to pick. We wanted to get into the processing, and so I remember we hitchhiked out to Banks, and uh, Grant was a year older and a year ahead of me, and so he had came to Forest Grove and, and went to Pacific. And so we were standing out on the highway there, hitching a ride at, at Banks, at the underpass, and and he said, "What are you gonna do this fall, Jim?" And I said, "I, I was still at GM Hill." I said, "Well, I suppose I'll just uh, continue milking cows and working at the grain elevator, as uh, as uh, much as I can, you know, in the fall, because I had worked there some in the it was right next." to the Mallory barn, it was a grain elevator. And uh, I said, I, I just work the two jobs and, and see how things go, you know. He said, well, why don't you go to college? And I said, well, thanks a lot, but I never considered myself college material. And he says, why? He said, you've got the capacity. He said, you're just as smart as any of the others. It's just, it, it's, the difference is whether, how much application you give, how, how you apply yourself. and. And uh, I said, well, uh, I didn't have the money. And he said, well, would you come to Pacific if, uh, if I got you a scholarship? And I said, well, you, you couldn't get me a scholarship because I didn't do anything that was, uh, that I wasn't a scholar. And he said, well, would it be worth my while to try? And I said, oh, you can try if you want. And, and uh, about 10 days later, why, I got a letter from Pacific that they'd give me a, a, a grant for activities that I had participated in for half of the tuition for two years. And so uh, uh, that's what it took to, to get me over the hill. And so uh, I, uh, I continued to work at the uh, grain elevator and milk cows until fall. And then I, I, I left and came to Pacific. Well, I, I stayed at home with the folks, you see, and then walked back and forth to, to Pacific from Willamine Avenue and and, uh, and had a good year. And uh, while I was there, uh, 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 Fritz Lemke, uh, I went out for football, and uh, and uh, he uh, said well, a bunch of the football players have joined the guard over there, and why don't I come over and look into it you know and so I went over with him one night and uh, and uh, they asked me my name and my date of birth and uh, and uh, uh, that was about it and uh, so uh, they s said well you can you can decide on whether you want to go you know well then I decided I didn't want the National Guard and so the next week I went back and uh, oh they said gee we've already sent your name into Washington and I went from the 
platoon sergeant to the first sergeant to, to the lieutenant to the captain and he was awful sorry but my name had already been sent in which was just a ruse for a country boy you see and so uh, they said uh, I said well I've got a class on the same night as you meet and they said what time is your class over and so I said it's nine o'clock and they said well if you we'll make you a deal if you'll come after class we'll give you full credit for the full drill and so I decided well I guess I'll accept that and so I, that's how I got into the National Guard well I went to Pacific that year and had a good year and, and uh, uh, showed myself that I could do it if I wanted to and, and uh, I, I, I got good average grades and, and uh, had a good time and so uh, came the end of the school year and, uh, and uh, I worked for a while in the uh, cannery and Ray Mailing Cannery at Hillsboro, and uh, then I'd gone out and on a day had a forest fire, and so I'd gone out and on the fire line for a few days, and I uh, the fire went out, got out, and so I, I came back home, and but I'd been out there for several days, and I was sleeping, and uh, somebody came to the door, and it was a a lady that had been a, visiting the Canes, who had moved to Puyallup, Washington, and. Uh, this lady uh, said she was wanted somebody to drive her car to California. She had a, a new Chevrolet, and uh, she said the Canes were all working, and they they suggested her she stop at the feet, and maybe one of the boys would be there. So uh, I uh, I the folks woke me up, and I I decided to take that, and so she wanted to go down the Oregon coast. And so uh, I drove her new Chevrolet for her, and we went down the Oregon coast and then the California coast, which was a, in those years was a very slow but scenic route. And she enjoyed the scenery, and I enjoyed the driving, and and uh, so we uh, got along fine. Well, when we got to the San Francisco area, uh, I said I wanted to get off and and uh, and uh, go and see Uncle Harold and, and uh, see the World's Fair there. And so uh, she was very disappointed. She offered to pay my transportation back if I just continued to, I don't remember what the sum she offered me, but uh, she, she wanted very badly me to drive her to Los Angeles. But I, uh, I just didn't really care to do that. And so I got off and and uh, went to visit Uncle Harold, who was at the Smith Ranch at San Rafael. And uh, this was a 600 cow dairy where they milked by hand with Portuguese, uh, Asia Islanders, uh, as milkers. And uh, so uh, they had a bunkhouse and, and they fed at a big table, you know. And, and so uh, I stayed there. And Harold uh, uh, looked around and he got me a job at Sonoma, California, with the hay baling crew. And so there was a, a, a bunch of us that, uh, I don't remember how many of us there actually were, but uh, we uh, slept in the horse barn and they had a cook shack that we took along with us. And uh, they had the cots that they gave us, you know, we'd just set them up in the horse barn. And we'd rig up a shower with a garden hose and, and uh, we bailed hay by the ton. Well, needless to say, that was quite a uh, a goal to to strive for. So uh, we uh, would be out in the fields waiting for the dew to get off enough so where we could start to bale in the morning. You know, uh, you get out in the fields. Uh, we would eat at the cook shack there. You know, and, and then uh, uh, go out to the fields and, and bale. And of course we'd bail all day long, just punching just as much as we could. And we were making about six, seven dollars a day, which beat 30 cents an hour by quite a little. And uh, so uh, we used to work six days a week and just just as long as we could. And, and, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I, I had saved a few hundred dollars and, and uh, uh, bought my bus ticket 
to go back to go another year to Pacific. And uh, so I went in one Sunday and bought the bus ticket. And then the following Sunday, I would catch the bus and and go to Forest Grove and, and get there Monday in time to register, you see, at Pacific. Well, uh, about Wednesday of that week, my mother forwarded a letter from the National Guard that they were going to be mobilized on September 16th, 1940, which was the date. So I, uh, I uh, instead of taking the bus to go to Forest Grove to enter Pacific, why, I took the bus to Forest Grove to enter the Army. And so uh, uh, the National Guard was mobilized, and we went first to Fort Lewis or Camp Murray, which was part of it. And of course, uh, they were, in 1940, they had very little equipment. They actually, well, what stuff they did have was World War One. You know, the old pants with the with the blossom sides, and then the wrap leggings and so forth. And and of course. Uh, uh, we, we moved into a row of tents and we had no, no just just tent living and, and, then, and then gradually why they built a, a row of kitchens that were very modest but uh, serviceable and you could eat inside and so forth and and then at the other end why they built a row of latrines so that you you had a shower and and uh, and toilet and and so uh, we didn't have uh, electricity, uh, but uh, that winter uh, they got some electricity and uh, they put it for the kitchen and the uh, 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 officer's tent and then the, the, the uh, county, uh, the, the company uh, uh, office was there. And so they, they, they put that and then of course what we'd go do is go in and dig wires and put extension cords down to uh, tents and and I was in the about the uh, fifth tent down. You see, from the 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 office, the officers, the sergeants, the the uh, artist first tent, and then and then uh, I was in the first platoon, and and so I spent the winter with uh, uh, Carl Anderson was the sergeant, and uh, and then. Uh, it was Wallace Gregg, and, and, uh, who now lives at Pure Palace, and Elmer Gursky, who lives at Hillsboro, and Harvey Thompson, and Jack Hewer, who both died, and myself, we were the six of us in that tent. And uh, they did, sometime during the uh, early part of the winter, bring in floors, wood floors, and we, so that we set our, our bunks, and, and uh, which were double-decked, and, so forth on, on the wood floor and so that's how we got by the first winter well uh well hold on a second here 